tumbles down Their kettles lamb of rough repair To learn tis roots of dusty brown In my compassion's bound to share Let every spark of vengeance roll Round lotus tops and twined And greet and light transform by love In lotus hard and shine When each light drop has passed away Across my pure white lily door When I have drained all sorrow may I speak to deck the lost lost floor Let every petal softly float In summer's golden shine Retreat to claim the splendid bride Nirvana's joy that's mine Very good morning, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Welcome to our fortnightly Sunday morning talks at BGF. My name is Bob Eaton and I'm the MC for this morning. Today's talk is the result of many questions that were asked during our 31st January talk by Bante on Chinese superstitious beliefs. This morning's talk is a sequel entitled The Guardian Deities. As uh, Bhante is a very good <coughs> uh, with chanting, I will start off the session by introducing Bhante. Then Bhante will lead the puja before delivering the Dhamma talk. After the Q&A, Bhante will also be sharing the merits. This talk is being cross bucket, bo broadcasted across eight Buddhist organizations. If any questions for Bhante, kindly write down in your Facebook pages and it will be relayed to Bhante for to answer. A uh, short introduction for Bhante. Bhante Dhammapala was born in Kuching in 1970. He was ordained as Upasampada Bhikkhu in Wat Chong Kada in 1994 under the most respected Chao Kun pra Raj Tamatera. Subsequently, Bhante sought spiritual independence under the guidance of Bhante Dhammasakaro Mahatero. He then spent the next 15 years studying Buddhist philosophy, Pali and Sanskrit literatures in Sri Lanka and Hong Kong. In 2009, Bhante obtained his Doctorate of Philosophy in Buddhist Studies under the supervision of Professor Venerable K.L. Damajoti in the University of Hong Kong. After his graduation, Bhante was appointed as Chief Editor and Spiritual Director for the Buddhist Door website. In 2010 to 2013, he was the visiting assistant professor at the Center of Buddhist Studies in the University of Hong Kong. Bhante is the founder and abbot of Brahma Vihara Monastery and Retreat Center Malacca, the Bodhivana Monastery of Sungai Pele, and the Center of Mindfulness in Hong Kong. He is also one of the monastic advisors of the Theravada Buddhist Council of Malaysia. Bhante travels frequently conducting meditation retreats Dhamma talks, Dhamma camps for youth and teens, and academic teachings in Malaysia, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and China. So over to you, Bhante. 
Today's talk will be entitled The Four Guardian The, the Guardian Deities. Is it my screen shared already? Namo Buddhaya, so now let us our morning puja, right? so together we recite Namo Dasa three times. Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sang Buddhasa Namo dasa bhagavato arahato samma sang buddhasa. Namo dasa bhagavato arahato samma sang buddhasa. Tisarana. Buddhang saranang gachami Dhammang saranang gachami Sanghang saranang gachami Dotiyang pi buddhang saranang Gachami Doti Yam Pidamang Saranang Gachami Doti Yam Pisangang Saranang Gachami Tati Yam Pibudang Saranang Gachami Tatiyam Pidamang Saranang Gachami Tatiyam Pisangang Saranang Gachami Panchasila Panati pata veramani sika padang samadhi yami adinna dana veramani sika padang samadhi yami kame sumin Chachara Veramani Sika Padang Samadhi Yami Mosavada Veramani Sika Padang Samadhi Yami Surame Rayamad Japamadatana Veramani Sika Padang Samadhi Yami Imani Pancha Sika Padani Samadhi Yami Imani Pancha Sika padani samadhi yami imani pancha sika padani samadhi yami idang me punyang asava Kaya wahang ho tu Idang me silang Ning banas Pachayo ho tu Buddha Nusati Recollection of the Buddha 
ปิโสวะภะคะวะอะระหังสัมมาสังโบดุงเวจาจารณะสัมปันโนสุกะโตโลกะวิโดอะโนตะโรโหริสะดัมมะสาระติสัตตาเดวามานุสานังบุตตะภะคะวาติดัมมานุสติ recollection of the dhamma suwakato bhagavata dhammo sandetiko Akaliko ehi pasiko opanaiko pachatang we ditabo vingyo hiti. Sangha Nusati, Recollection of the Sangha. Supati Pano Bhagavato Savaka Sanko Ujupati Pano Bhagavato Savaka Sanko Nyaya Pati Pano Bhagavato Savaka Sanko Samichi Pati Pano Bhagavato Savaka Sanko Yadidang Chattari Purisa Yogani Atta Purisa Pogalang Esa Bhagavato Savaka Sanko Ahuneyo, Pahuneyo, Dakineyo, Anjali Karaniyo, Anotara Punyaketang Loka Sati. Sadu. Sadhu, Sadhu. Namo Buddhaya. Good morning. So in Theravada tradition, uh, uh, before we start any blessing in a ceremony, we usually will chant this verse of invitation of devas, inviting, protecting deities you know, from the galaxies, the devas who live in the Kamadhatu and Rupadhatu, on peaks and mountains, in palaces, in the sky, in an island countries and towns, in growth of trees, fields to come to listen to the words of the Buddhas for their rebirth in heaven and attending Nibbana. So here is a verse, so I can recite in Pali. Samanta chakvalesu atra gakchantu devata sadhammang munirajas Sunantu Sakamokadam. From around the galaxies, may the devas come here. May they listen to the true Dharma of the King of the Sage, leading to heaven and emancipation. And also, next verse is Sagge Kamech Rupe, Giri Sikaratate, Chantalike. Vimane, Dipe, Ratte Chagame, Taruwana Gahane, Geha Watumhe Kete. 
So the meaning, those in the heaven of sensuality and form, on peaks and mountain, in palaces, in the sky, in island, countries, towns, in groves of trees, around home sites and field. And we also chant in other verses, that is, Bhumma Jayanto Deva Jala Thala Visame Yakka Gandhabha Naga Tittanta Santi Keyang Muni Vara Vachanang Sadhavo Me Sunantu All the earth devas, spirits, Gandhas, Gandhabas, Nagas, in water, on land, in uneven land and standing nearby. May they come and listen with approval as I recite the word of the excellent sage. So this is a verse of inviting the deities and they live in the lower, uh, lower heaven, right? Or in the human world. So we invite them, you know, in the Theravada tradition to listen to the Buddha's teaching and in return, we hope they can protect the world, to free the world from calamities, to protect people from harms and danger. So in this recitation of inviting guardian deities, there are mentioned these four protecting devas. They are uh, non-humans, right? They are generally called non-humans. And this recitation also mentioned places where they live. So these four classes of non-human beings, right, are the first of devas. The second is the spirits, or we call yakka. Sanskrit we call yaksha. And heavenly musician, Gandhabha, and the nagas. So they are called the worldly spirits of the earth devas, and those good ones, we call them the guardians of Buddhism. So though the words devas is mentioned as one of the guardian deities, but remember, there are two types of devas. One is higher devas, and one is the lower devas. And the lower devas are called the earth devas, earth devas, right? Because they live on different parts of the mountain at the center of the world, which is called Sumeru, or now today we call it uh, Himalaya. And the second lowest devas are the, town, our other, the second lowest devas of the, the, the earth devas, they are the Tawatimsa, right? Who live on the peak of the Sumeru, right? And we know that the king of the Tawatimsa Deva is Saka, right? And then you also have another, the lowest Devas, right? They are called the Maha, they are called the Maha Chatu Maharajika, four heavenly great king, and they guard the four quarters of the earth. So these four guardian deities, which are, which are going to see today, they are Gandhabha, Naga, Yaka, they consider as the earth devas. They are belonging to the lower devas. And usually, you know, in our Theravada tradition, we share and rejoice marriage with those uh, devas instead of offering food to them because they do not need food. And these deities are considered as ordinary beings, huh? because they have defilements like anger and desire, and they also have uh, difficulties. So what we can do is to rejoice the Mary with them, right, and radiate loving kindness and compassion with them. So today, we will look at these four guardian deities reflected in this verse of recitation. They are, again, Devas, Yaka, right, Gandhabha, and Naga. So we are going to see each one of them, right? And of course, these deities are very pre-Buddhistic. They are worshipped even by Buddhist people as guardian deities, right? Who can give us specific protective uh, function. 
And now, the lowest realms of heaven, we are talking about they are all together seven heavens, all right? And the lowest is the, <clears throat> we call it the four heavenly king, right? And they belong to the earth devas. And these realms of four heavenly king, uh, they come together with a multitude of other beings. And they are known, uh, um, what are these, uh, you know, multitudes of other beings? They are, you know, we know that there's four heavenly king. They are the leaders of various beings who are reciting together, right? And these four heavenly kings, they control Yaka, Gandaba, the, um, and what do you call it? Kumbanda, right? And some people say that the Kundamba is a, belonging to a class of Ashura being or belonging to a class of Preta, you see? So we, we don't see, you know, the exact class this Kumbanda belongs. And you also, and also another one is the Nagas. Then, for example, right, in the north direction, uh, guarded uh, by the King Vesavana, who holds an umbrella, right? Who holds an umbrella and who control the Yaka. So it means that the Yaka is controlled by the King Vesadwana uh, in the north direction, right? So then in the east direction, guarded by the King Dattarata, who hold a mandolin, right? And they control the Gandaba, or sometimes we call, we translate them as a celestial devas musician. Then in the south direction, guarded by the king, Veruhaka, who hold a sword and control the Kumbandas, or lower devas and praetors. You see, even the praetor is also controlled by this king of the south direction. And in the west direction, um, it's guarded by the Verupaka, who hold a snake and they control the Nagas. So these four heavenly kings, you see, they are the leaders of these four protective uh, guardians, and including the Ashura and the Praetors. Um, now we are going to see, uh, continue, right? Then do Buddhists pray and engage in idol worshiping? Now, what is the difference between paying respect? When we say pay respect or do a prayer, what are the difference? When we say paying respect to the Buddhas cannot be equated with the prayer. And praying is associated with uh, making a request from a higher being, such as God or the Brahma, etc. And those requests are for the mundane happiness such as health, right? wealth, material things, and protection. And Buddhists do not pray. Buddhists engage in morality, right? concentration, and wisdom for the realization of Nibbana. So therefore, the goal of a Buddhist is to attain Nibbana. So this is, this is done by cleansing our mind so that the defilements are completely purged and eradicated and of course a buddhist uh, never asks favor from the buddha right because the buddha taught us to abstain from this immoral deeds speech and thought by controlling our mind such as by being mindful or by being knowing clearly right so why do buddhists pay respect to symbols representing the buddha I think we Buddhists must know one thing. You see, we pay respect to the Buddhas. It is meant for our, cult, our devotional practice, right? And Buddhists pay respect to the Bodhi tree. That is because the Buddha was enlightened under the Bodhi tree. So the Buddha paid his gratitude to the sacred Bodhi tree that gave him shared when he attained enlightenment. So after the Buddha's enlightenment, 
uh, it says that the Buddha spent two weeks looking at the Bodhi tree as an act of gratitude for sheltering him during his struggle for enlightenment. So in Sri Lanka, people used to go to the temple, especially during full moon day, you know, to attain religious ceremony and listen to the Buddha's discourses. So people would go to the temple earlier, right? And they would offer flowers, you know, to the Buddhas or like some oil lamps and incense or recite several gathers while making those offerings. Then they would sit and listen to the Dharma preaching, you know, by a bhikkhu. That really helps calming their mind and get into a mindset where one is able to forget about their day-to-day -day stresses and comprehend the teachings of the Buddhas. So the calm and serene image of the Buddhas is conducive to calming one's mind. So the Buddhists worship Buddha statues, body tree, or stupa to express their devotion, right, and calming the mind. And therefore, one can meditate with a calm mind. Their offering flowers symbolize the anicca nature, anicca, which means impermanent, right? These flowers are beautiful, you know, when offered, but in a couple of days, they become wicked, wicked, right? And so one is supposed, you know, to contemplate on the impermanent nature, you know, displayed by the decays of those flowers. Then Buddhists also offer incense, right? But here, I, I want to add extra remark, you know, that is to say, when we offer the incense, you see, that represents the precept substance, or sometimes we call it um, virtue substance, right? Uh, in Chinese, we call it xiang ha. They, uh, in Dhammapada, it is said that the Buddha was very ill right before his death. So the Sakadeva, right, the king of the devas, he took care of the Buddhas and you know, brushed you know, the Buddha's feet. But the Buddha told the heavenly king, right, told the Sakadeva to leave the earth as the smell of human being is as smelly as the rotten meat. Then the Buddha, the Buddha told the Saka that he has bhikkhus to take care of him. Then the Sakadeva right, replied to the Buddhas, the Sakadeva um, can smell the fragrant, right? Uh, or the, the precept fragrant. <laughs> no, the smell from far away. Uh, it says that from far 84,000 miles away. Therefore, because of this precept substance, the Sakadeva came to take care of the Buddhas. Although we said God right, avoid approaching human because of the bad smell, right? However, because of the percept substance, the virtuous fragrance that cover the odours of the human body. So the God are willing to come close to protect or to guard the good people who observe the good morality. So the incense represents the precept substance and the guardian devas, they will come to protect you if you have good morality. Right? So um, then the lighting uh, of candles or oil lamps symbolizes wisdom. So when we know this symbol, you don't have to rely on any prayers or wear amulets, etc. The morality itself has this power of protection. And the protector deities or the gods will love to come to the earth to protect people who observe morality. As we have said just now, there are two types of uh, God, right? two types of God. One is a God living in the upper realms, upper heaven, right? Uh, they are suspending, you know, in the, in the air. They include the Brahma, they, and they include the Brahma way as well, or the Rupa Dhatu. And of course, they are belonging to the higher realms, okay, higher devas. That is because they are free from contact with the Ashura. 
as we know that Ashuras, they like to fight with, the, with God, right? With the Devas, right? So when we talk about the higher Devas, they consist of the four higher uh, Devas, including the Brahma. That's why the Buddhists also sometimes pray to the Brahma, right? So these four um, uh, higher Devas, they are called like Yama, Tushita, uh, Nirmana, Rati Devas, and para nirmita vasavartin devas, right? So these are the four higher devas plus Brahma God. Then there is another types of God who live in the lower heavens, right? And they are residing on the ground. And you know, Ashura, they like to fight with the devas, you know, because their nature is of fighting. So they like to fight with the devas of the lower realm. Right? And we talk about the lower realms, uh, they are belonging to the Tawatimsa Devas and the Chatu Maharajika Devas. Right? So these lower Devas, they live on different parts of the mountain, right? at the center of the world, which is called the Sumeru. And they live on the ground and they used to engage in strife right? and fighting with the Ashuras. Now, Tawatimsa, sometimes we call uh, devas of the 33, okay? or the 33 gods, we call them Tawatimsa. They live on the peak right, of the Sumeru, and their ruler is Saka, right, or Saka Deva. It is said in the suttas, Saka was attained the Sotapanna after listening to the Buddha's teaching. Then, you also have another class of devas, the lowest is called the Chatu Maharajika, Sita Tian Wang, right? Who guard the four quarters of the earth and they control four types of earthly demigods or the spirits. Uh, we repeat again that is the Gan, uh, Naga, Yaksha, Gandhava, or Kumbandas. Or, a kind of uh, in Ashura or Raiders, right? So now, yeah, we have talked so many things on these uh, different types of beings, okay? Belong controlled by these four great heavenly king. And there is also another types of class of being they call Ashura, right? Ashura. And this Ashura sometimes is also included among the devas. And of course, we know that they are the opponents, right? Of the devas, of four heavenly king and the god of 33. Because their nature is, is engaged in fighting in the war and fighting and fighting, right? And of course, there are good uh, Ashura as well, right? Like good and bad. Now, uh, when you talk about uh, the devas, right? Uh, um, or those who want to reborn right in the heaven and particularly in buddhist meditation right there is a type of meditation mentioned in the visuddhimagga they call the recollection of the devas <clears throat> and here the word devas refer to the six deva realms okay six deva realms including right brahma realms brahma realm is the first uh, heaven of the Rupa Dhatu. So six plus one, you have seven, right? Together under the recollection of the devas. So it is also said that, uh, okay, now I read that uh, it says that in the, in the Visuddhi Magga, they said, a noble disciple, right? Develop the recollection of the devas. Okay, thus, you know how you want to do it in your recollection of devas. Uh, you can recite like this. This, this is English. English huh? There are deities in the realms of the four king, right? Four great heavenly king, right? There are deities in the realms of the 33, and there are deities in the realms of Yama. There are deities in the realms of Tushita. There are deities in the realms of Nimanarati, and there are deities in the realms of Paranimitta Vasavati. And the seven. There are deities in the Brahma retinue, right? So there are deities higher than that. 
So this is found in me. So continue, right? How to, right? How to how to go how to go there, right? And it says that we have to cultivate these five qualities, right? After cultivating these five qualities, you see repeatedly. Then after the passing away, you know, in this life, one will be reborn in one of those heaven, right? And what are these qualities? It says that in the recollection of these devas, we need to possess these five qualities in order to be reborn in those heaven. And these five qualities are faith, right? Moral discipline means sila, learning, right? Like you are coming to listen to the talk, you see, you keep learning so that you understand, right? Learning. Learning is very important, right? And another one is giving, right? Generosity and wisdom. So these are the five qualities, right? Faith, sila, learning, generosity, and wisdom. That is true that we pass on a practice, <clears throat> right? So you see, there is found in me such faith, moral discipline, learning, generosity, and wisdom as those devas possess, because of which when we pass away, when they pass away from this world, they were reborn there. So this is the types of recollection of devas. Now we look at the second one, okay? Now, second one is a yaka, right? Yaka. And we talk this yaka, uh, they are, what do you call, uh, the retinue of one of the, you know, the four great king, right? The retinue. And yeah, in most of the, you know, depiction, yaka looks like ghost, right? As you can see, it looks like ghosts. But in fact, they are not, they are not ghosts, right? We call them, they are demigod. Not ghosts, but they are demigod, yeah? It means that half human and half god. So according to Malala Sekara, Right, he say, she say, he say, yaka is a class of non-human being, amanusa. They are mentioned together with devas, gandabas, mahoraga. It means that it's also nagas, mentioned together. Then, according to the bhikkhu body, he said the yaka are fierce spirits inhabiting remote areas such as forest, hill, and abandoned cave. They are depicted as a a uh, hideous mean and rough temperament. But when giving offering and shown respect, they become benign, benevolent, and may protect people rather than harming them. So this is the bhikkhu bodhis uh, understanding, right? So the yaksha now is a class. Uh, we know that it's, it's a class of non-human being. And some yakshas having a very what they call rafu temperament, and some are very kind, right? Very good hearted if we worship and respect them. And the yaka, right? Uh, also has uh, many categories, and there are good yaka and there are bad yaka as well. And the highest among the yaka, they are very near to the devas and they have the devas power. And the lowest yaka is very resembled to the praetors. That's why, you know, in the suttas, you know, the praetors also considered as a god, right? But they belong to the very lowest one. We are not saying that all praetors are bad. They are praetors are very good, right? And they have merit. So since the yaka is a being who live in the wholesome realm, right? Because they are demigod, huh? So if he has the opportunity to listen to the Dharma, now he still can realize the path and fruition, like the King Bimbisara, who was reborn as a yaka, you know, under the reti, under the, the what do you call it, the guardians of the King Vasa Vana. So in the Buddhist discourses, right, yaksha can pretend as a human being, right? When they become a human being, their eyes are red. Right? Sometimes we call that, you look like Yaksha. Huh? <laughs> and they neither wink or cast a shadow. Right? And some are very cruel, right? They can even harm human beings and they love to eat human flesh. So in the suttas, it is also said that, uh, you know, there are male Yaksha and there are female Yaksha. 
the female yaksha we call the yakini. And they are more fearful and evil minded or full of evil, right? Than the male yaksha. You know, they eat the flesh, they eat blood, right? And they even eat men who enter into their territories. So, and this yaksha, they have also the ability to transform into a beautiful woman, right? With magical power, you know, to lure men who do not guard the eyes faculties. So for travelers, right, we have, we usually hear, right, uh, uh, for travelers, you see, they lost their way, you know, in the forest, right, mm, or those who are rushing at night, if they see another village in the middle of the night and see the, you know, bustling village, then we have to be careful because, uh, you know, we might encounter the Yaksha village and especially the lure, you know, passerby, you know, the people, you know, who come to stay and this Yaksha will eat them. Yeah, so usually we heard uh, this story. <clears throat> so like a human, right, right, human Yaksha, they also have the good and the bad character. And the good yaka, then we consider them as the, you know, the guardians of the, the Buddhism, right? Or the disciple of the Buddhas or who have, right, been you know, taking refuge in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. Or even we heard in the suttas that some yaksha, they are already a saint who live in the times of the Buddhas. Particularly, there's a name called Alawaka Yaka who was subdued by the Buddhas, and after hearing the Buddha's teaching, he realized the Sotapanna. So in addition, uh, the great supporters, the King Bimbisara, who was also reborn, you know, as a, as a powerful Yaksha, and he has a supernatural power. And in Myanmar, uh, there is this popular worship of na the, the natural spirits, the Yaksha called the Nats, I don't know whether I correct, spell it correctly. And who are, you know, worship alongside, you know, of Buddhism. So wherever you go the temple, you will find this kind of yaksha protecting the temple. And yeah, as you know, these are form, oh, sorry. Eh? Uh, sorry, okay, you look at this. Huh? Yeah, this one. Yeah, this one is a yaka in Thailand. Yeah, I think most of you are quite familiar with, you know, these faces of yaksha. And usually this yaksha, they were stood in front of the temple, you know, they guard the temple, they protect the people with good morality. So we find this kind of yaksha, but we don't see people worship them, right? They, are, they, they stood there to protect, you know, the temple. Um, Okay, then in the uh, Atanatiya Suttas of the Nikaya, this Sutta is very important because uh, this Sutta is talking about the Yaka. And in this Sutta, there is a description of the bad Yaka who disturb the Buddhist monk who live in the mountain or in the cave or in the forest. Therefore, one of the four heavenly kings, like the king, uh, Vasavana, he was very worried that this evil yaksha yeah, would harm the disciple of the Buddhas. So he went to see the Buddhas and told the Buddhas that um, this, uh, you know, yaksha, right? They, they don't respect, they have no faith, right, in the Buddha Dharma. And they, they are very evil because they don't observe the five precepts. So, in order to instill, right, we talk about instill faith in this yaksha, then the king, uh, you know, offered the Atanatiya Suttas to the Buddhas and asked the Buddhas, you know, disciple, right, to chant these suttas, or as well as for the lay people to chant these suttas for their protection from these evil spirits. So, in Buddhist tradition, right, in order to free Buddhists from evil spirits, 
we usually will chant, you know, these Atanatiya Suttas. Of course, this Atanatiya Sutta will be chanted as a last resort. Usually before the Atanatiya Sutta, you know, there are also a few other suttas that are also very important, right, in the chanting of, uh, you know, uh, uh, like a, uh, uh, the casting the, the evil away. They are the Metta Suttas, or they are the Dajaka Suttas, or they are the Ratana Suttas, and together with Atanatiya Suttas. So these four suttas are very important in our Theravada Buddhist chanting, particularly you know, to free a person from a evil spirit. And uh, we find in China, in Japan, if you, you know, able to come across or, you know, visit the minor temple in China or in Japan, usually you find, you know, the temples are guarded by the four heavenly king at the main gate of the temple. And these four heavenly king, right? They got the four direction, north, south, east, and west. And each one of them control their own accompanying retinue, right? The Yaka, Gandaba, Naga, and Earth Devas. So, so it is quite interesting, right? Uh, to note that in the suttas, uh, particularly in the Anguttara Nikaya, in the suttas called the Maha, in the Chatu Maharajika suttas, the four king, uh, together with their sons and ministers, right? <laughs> they will come to the world and survey the world, you know, during the Uposatta's days to see where the human beings are observe the following, right? Yeah, these three things are very important. This why uh, Buddhists, you know, they want to observe the Ed Precept, or like in most of the Buddhist country, they will come to the temple, observe the Ed Precept, because during these days, the Sakadeva, you know, the, the Chatu Maharajika, they will inspect the human being, check whether human beings are paying respect to their parents or not, or paying respect to the monk or to the Brahmin or to the elders of the family, right? This is one thing. And they also will come to the earth to check whether human beings observe at precepts or not, on the first or the fifteenth or the lunar 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 month, then they also will come and check whether human perform meditorious deeds or not. Then this Satu Maharajika, you know, after surveying the world, then they will you know go back and announce their finding, right, or their report to the Tawa Timsa Devas. So why we have such a belief right, in the suttas? Right? Then that again, you have to connect with the God because we said the God will protect the good people who pay respect to the parents, you know, those who are observing the precepts and those who do a meritorious deeds. So if there are good practice in the world, Right? If the human beings are still doing good in the world, right? or if there are still good people living a holy life, the God will be very happy. And because in the future, there will be more people right, reincarnated in the heaven, in the heaven right? then the number of gods will be more than the Asuras, so that <laughs> they will not be afraid of Asuras. Yeah? So this, this is how it says like that. Yeah? So I find it very interesting. The God come to the earth, they want to check whether people in the world do good deeds or not. And they are very happy because when they die, they will reborn in the heaven, right? And they can, you know, when the numbers are more in the heaven, they can fight with the Asuras. Yeah, of course, this is one of the understanding. Huh? And then again, there is a suttas in the Anguttara Nikaya 7. It's called the Adamika Suttas, right? Adamika so that means unrighteous. It says that if people in the world are not righteous, becoming more and more greedy, or do not observe the precepts, they do evil deeds, they are no longer filial piety to the parents, and they are no longer respecting the teachers or respecting the treasurers, right? Or they hold a very bad views, right? Etc. 
then there will be less people reborn in the heaven. And more and more people will be reborn in the Ashura, in the ghost, in the beast, or in the hell. Then at that time, the God will no longer be guarding the world. That as a result, people in the future will have to have, will have, to, have to face various disasters and calamities such as droughts, famines, you know, the pandemic, and wars. So it is said that the yaksha at that time will be rampant, right, eating people. So we see in the other Adamic suttas, in the Anguttara Nikaya, it says that when the king or government is not righteous, right, then the royal officer, means that the government servants uh, become unrighteous. When royal officers are unrighteous, the Brahmin and the householders become unrighteous. When Brahmins and householders are unrighteous, the people of town and country become unrighteous. When the people of towns and countries are, un are unrighteous, the causes of the moon and the sun also become erratic. Then uh, the cause of the star and constellation also become erratic, etc. The day and night, the month and the fortnight, and the season and years become erratic. The blowing of the winds become erratic and chaotic. And the deities are anger, right? The heavens don't provide enough rain. The crops ripen erratically. So when people eat crops that have ripened erratically, they become short-lived, right? Ugly, weak, or sick. So this is exactly what we are experiencing now. And people are deteriorating, you know, in their morality and they are very greedy and they have a very corrupted mind. Then as a result, you know, we suffer, particularly during these unprecedented, you know, the diseases, disease called the COVID-19. So Buddhists should contemplate, you know, this for a while, yeah? thinking, what are the remedies we can do to overcome these remedies? So we should, take this opportunity, you know, by, by practicing good deeds and morality, you know, by spreading the loving kindness and compassion so that the world will become a better place to live. So now we have seen the devas, we have seen the yaka, right? I hope by now you, sh you know what it is, right? And now we look at the Gandhava. Here, I have a lot of confusion, right? And a lot of people having confusion. Confusion or antarbhava or, inter, or intermediate being with Gandhava. So the word Gandhava can be very confused, right? To many people. And that's because due to the various understanding, various interpretation, the suttas. And first of all, it is a very important sutta. It's called the Asalayana. Uh, Asalayana suttas. And it says that in these suttas, Gandhava is one of the condition for the conception of a being, right? One of the conception. Then how should we understand this concept of Gandhava if Theravada rejected the intermediate being? Then what is exactly the Gandhava? That's the question. If you say the Gandhava is an intermediate being, then does it contradict the Buddha's own teaching that there is no in-between state between death and rebirth. Then what is the implication of Gandhava in the suttas used by the Buddhas? And more important in the case, why well, in this case the Gandhava is the Dharma protector? Why? Is this the same Gandhava? So there are a lot of questions puzzling. Uh, today we are going to uh, solve them, right? <laughs> to explain them. So now we look at this, it's the Sarvastivada views of Gandhar of Antarbhava because it, they are the earliest who propose this Antarbhava, right? It's an intermediate being. So these intermediate beings evolve and develop by the Sarvastivada. It's one of the very earliest school of sectarian Buddhism, right? It's originated from, you know, the Kashmir, right? Or the Northern India and Kashmir. And of course, eventually, you know, their concept, many of their concepts 
eventually accepted you know, by other school of Buddhists, particularly the Mahayana. Then of course, although in the past, uh, many teachers right, had different views of the intermediate being, but they believe, okay, there was a being after the, the destructions of the faculty of life and four great elements before their reincarnation, it says that there was a transition period before it takes rebirth. And it means there is a gap in between, right? The death of a sentient being and the rebirth of the next life. So there's a gap, right? And they believe that the karma of a sentient being may not be ripened immediately after death. So they said they will stay sometimes in an intermediate state waiting to be reborn. Then, of course, this is an explanation from the Sarvastivada, right? And they said, how long a being should stay in an intermediate being after death? Then, of course, different commentators, different teachers, you know, they have different opinions. And some say it takes for a while. Some say it takes one day, seven days, or seven, seven, 49 days, or even a longer time. And all these are recorded in their ancient treatise called the Mahavibhasha Sastra and the Apidhamma Kosha Bhasha, right? So it's one of the ancient texts, right? Even early, much earlier than the Visuddhimagga. And good, I think, Buddhist disciple, right? Those with a, those with a proper view, right? Uh, understanding, uh, they can easily identify. Uh, this kind of thought is quite similar to those people who believe in an permanent self. <clears throat> okay, and this kind of belief is a belief of an ancient outside heretics and who advocated, you know, the people have soul after death. And this kinds of belief of soul was introduced to Buddhism by an ancient teacher who, is, who instead advocating a permanent view, immortality, external self to explain life after death. And why we need this view? That is because, you know, this, this proposed, right? Uh, teaching is very simple and easy to understand and easy to be accepted, you know, by people who don't have a proper view. So you just tell them that when a person die, it is a soul that reincarnated, nothing else. So it is very simple, easy to be, to understand. So in the past, uh, there were many teachers, you know, while discussing the Buddha's teaching on non-self, very often, they indirectly penetrated, you know, some kind of teaching of eternal soul that taken from other school of heretics, right? In order to explain the Buddhist teaching on rebirth, samsara, or reincarnation, etc. So if we Theravada Buddhists were to understand the teaching of the intermediate being, uh, we must adhere, right, to the principle of non-self. That is to say, the intermediate being refer to being, right? Is ready to be reborn, right? It's not the soul, but it's a being ready to be reborn. And this term must not be mistaken for a permanent soul. So intermediate being is just another name for a being who has reborn in another state of life. It means that after one's death, right? So it is not the soul that hanging around in an intermediate gap. So how is the look of Antarbhava, right? Here the, the word is Gandhava, if were to exist. So in the sectarian Buddhist tradition, uh, of course they believe intermediate being is really exist, right? And they appear in the human form, like a seven years old boy, right? Seven years old uh, young boy. Right? And they are and they have the capable of seeing, hearing, testing, you know, smelling and thinking. So, however, uh, something very interesting, they said not everyone has intermediate being after that. Then who has no intermediate being? 
They say that only people who are reborn in the heaven and those who are reborn in the hell after death, they do not have intermediate being. So excluding the heaven, excluding the hell. And what remains is assurance, right? And the ghosts, they are the closest to these kinds of intermediate being. Then what is the nature of the intermediate being uh, described in the Mahavibhasya Sastra? So in this text, right? And first of all, I think I have to explain to you, this text was composed during the uh, Fourth Buddhist Council right, in the Northern tradition, right? So it's composed and it's a very huge text, right? Consists of 200 fascicles. And in this text, you, you find the earliest record of this intermediate being. They are these four. It says, this intermediate being is born spontaneously, meaning that it born and appears naturally. And this is one, one of the four births, right? So in this sutta says that born in this birth, right? Include also devas, hell, intermediate being, and the ghost, right? Then, other three types of birth are born from the eggs, you know, born from the womb and born from the moisture in the humid places. Then the second one, the body of intermediate being is very subtle. It means that it consists of the four great elements. It means that people who develop certain psychic power, they are able to see the under bhava, right? And each body, is nourished by the incense, okay? Incense or by sacrificial uh, offering like food. Okay, it means that, you know, those in Tarabawa, they're able to eat the food offered by their relative. And the fourth, the intermediate being has the opportunity to be reborn into another state of life when his relative doing married and transferred married to them. So it means that once they take the Mary and rejoice, and they will immediately take rebirth. Okay. So if you if you look at this, judging from the about nature, uh, I think in one of my in one of my talk, I talk about this intermediate being. I said that this intermediate being belonging to the type of the ghost predators, and there is a specific type of ghost. It's called the ghost. Who live on the gift of others. Because this is these types of gods who live on the gift of others, they are able to consume the food. They are able to enjoy the food offered by their relative. Okay. Uh, then, of course, in Mahayana Buddhism, there is a type of the Dharma assembly called the deliverance for the intermediate being. Okay, it says in which the intermediate being is invited to come to the assembly, you know, to hear the Dharma, you know, to repent, right, for the evil deeds done in the past, and to make them rejoice in the assembly in order to achieve deliverance from the state of intermediate being. So, from this explanation, the intermediate being is the ghost, it's surely the ghost who live on the gift of others. And they are the ghosts who are born spontaneously. They are having four great elements. They are nourished by incense or, and nourished by the, by the offering. And they are capable to obtain food and merits dedicated by their relative done on their name. Okay? So why heretic says there is an intermediate being? after death. How do they know? You see, how do they know there is intermediate being after death, right? Some ancient Indian, you know, heretics, okay, or the shamanas, who have attained certain level of concentration, or those who have attained, you know, certain level of mastery of divine eyes. They can see many people with their own uh, divine eyes after their death, especially those who are neither good nor, nor too bad, uh, not too good, right? And after that, they're reborn in the realms of ghosts, you know, before they're reincarnated in other realms. 
And these outside heretics, right, they mistakenly believe that there is this intermediate being connected, you know, one's death to another new slide. So that they are very certain, right, that there is this intermediate being after death. You know, this intermediate being will hang around looking for his immediate ripple. So, as a Buddhist, right, as a Theravada Buddhist, should we believe the existence of this intermediate being? <laughs> and of course, in Theravada tradition, there is no such belief of intermediate being. But because of the, because of the influence of the traditional Chinese belief, right, that most of our Chinese Theravada practitioners, you know, when they talk about, they do accept certain forms of, you know, existence of the, the intermediate being, right? Eventually they will talk about, uh, we need to, you know, do the marriage for 49 days, you know, in order to share the marriage with our departed ones. And I think by now, uh, you have already got the answer, right? To the question, uh, who is this intermediate being? Is there any intermediate being in the Theravada Buddhism? And I think I need to share with you a very important message that is, the Buddha says, a sentient being who has fallen into evil plans of existence is very rare for him to be reborn in the good plans of existence. Right? Especially as a Buddhist, we are vows you know, for our long-term happiness, you know, to be reborn as a human being again, or deities in the next life. Then why should we want to believe there is this uh, intermediate being? Or why we should believe there is this uh, belief of reborn as a ghost, of intermediate ghost, right? So I think here, uh, my advice is don't incline your mind, okay? Uh, you know, to be reborn in the intermediate being. Because I judge from the earlier explanation, this intermediate being is belonging to a ghost. Okay, it's a type of ghost. But this type of ghost is very meritorious, right? Because they are able to eat the food. Not all the ghosts are able to eat the food. So don't incline your mind towards that. Huh? Then now we look at... Um, the pre-Buddhist concept of Gandharva. Gandharva, this one is in Sanskrit. Pali is Gandharva, right? Then come back to our guardian deities because we have been talking about the guardian deities. Why? What is Gandharva as the guardian deities? I think, uh, first of all, this Gandharva is a very pre-Buddhist concept. And yeah, as we have said earlier, right? Then in an ancient Indian Brahmanic tradition, they believe, right, after the death of a being, you know, his consciousness, right, uh, which is believed to be eternal, will continue to be reincarnated. And this reincarnated consciousness will be transformed into the Gandharva, which they believe is an entity, uh, you know, in the intermediate state between death and the next life, uh, which is a semi-divine being, they associated with the fatality and associated with a god called the Soma, right? So this is the ancient belief of India. Yeah, they, they talk about the Gandharva. They associate with, you know, another kind of god called Soma. Then in another ancient text called the Atharva Veda, one of the oldest Vedas, the term Gandharva stand for the celestial being that feed on fragrant, okay? And in that context, they said that this Gandhava will drew in the, uh, stay in the sea or stay in the, you know, the sky. Oh, and even they said this Gandhava belongs to the realm inferior to the four great kings. And of course, the Sarvastiva, they also inherited this concept of Gandharva. And they translated as a god who feeds on the fragrant. Or there is an, as another term for the intermediate being. Okay, so the Buddhist conception of Gandhava appears to have the its roots in the Vedic uh, Gandharva, 
which had a particular function of transmitting things from one world to another. So these words, Gandhava, has taken in right, and discussed in Buddhism. So you find the following references in the suttas. Okay? In the suttas called the Asalayana suttas, the word Gandhava is used to refer to one of the three conditions for the conception of beings. That is to say, the descents into the mother's womb, right? Okay. Uh, you know, through the junction of these three conditions, it means that the unions of the fathers and mother, the mother is in the season, and the Gandhava is present. So this is, in that context, the Gandhavas, okay, occur. Then, in a Buddhist legend, the Gandhava is also appear as a music god in the heaven, right, or in the celestial musician. And they are mostly, you know, resemble you know, to the, you know, to the nature of human and they feed on the fragrant and he lives on the tops of the Mount Sumerio and they serve the Sakadeva. Then there is another legend uh, says that the Gandhava is a celestial musician and is a class of being belonging to the Ashura, right? Ashura, inhabited in the east of the Chatu Maharajika realm and controlled by the king Dattarata. So, of course, we have earlier said that the, the Gandhava has a male and female gender, and the female Gandhava is called the god of flying through the air. Sanskrit we call the Apsara, which is Fei Tian. Huh? And it's, uh, you know, elegant flying image of heaven uh, being often, you know, painted on the walls of the ancient Buddhist temple, right? Even if you go to the Sri Lanka, you see, you also find some of these Apsara painted, you know, at the ancient wall. Then another legend also says that Gandhava belongs to the realms of ghost and Ashura. So you can see a lot of definition, okay, to the meaning of the Gandhava. And so in the Asalayana Suttas, right, the word Gandhava occur as one of the conditions for the conception of being. So, and there's a record, right? A record, how a Brahmin attempted, you know, to challenge the Buddhas on the issue of the caste superiority. Particularly Brahmins, you know, they believe they are born, you know, from the mouth of the, of the Brahma and they belong to the superior caste. So in that context of uh, argument, the Buddha pointed out that three conditions are required for the conception of being. One is the present or Gandhava. If so, you cannot say that the which caste the Gandhava belong to. So the Buddha questioned the Brahmin, can you identify the Gandhava belonging to the Brahmin caste or belonging to the Khatiya caste or belonging to the Vesha caste or belonging to the Sudha caste? So at the, at the end of the suttas, the Buddhas make it clear, it is groundless to believe, you know, that the Brahmanika belief of the caste superiority. So it says that the Buddha rejected the concept of Gandhava, right? Then, of course, the Buddha already knew the terms of Gandhava, use the Bra Brahmin, right? That is the intermediate state between the death and the next life or a kind of semi-god or demigod being associated with fatality, about to be reborn when they see the sexual acts of the future parents, right? So this concept of Gandhava is completely rejected by the Buddha himself. Then why still the Buddha proposed the Gandhava in the Asalayana Sutta, right? So again, the Buddha made use of the Brahmanical conception of the Gandharva yeah, because this was the earliest, you know, the pre-Buddhistic and the Brahmin that believe of this Gandhava. So the Buddha made use of this Gandhava, right, to point out that inconsistency in the Brahmanic caste system. For example, if both parents are from the different caste, say the husband is from 
the Brahmin caste, the wife is from the Sastriya caste. Then that is to say, husband is born of the mother of Brahma and born, and the wife is born of the shoulder of Brahma. When they were in the sexual acts, it is a Gandharva, right? <clears throat> then, then to which this Gandharva belongs, right? So you cannot identify the caste identity of your child, nor to establish the purity of the Brahmin caste. So it is ridiculous, right? So the Buddha uses the concept of Gandharva to reject their caste system that created by their creator God. Unless you talk about the Gandharva of Brahmin, Gandharva of Shastriya, etc. So the Buddha uses the concept of Gandharva to reject the Brahmanic ideas about the caste system, not the Brahma God that presides over the conception and determine the caste of the children. Right? So in the Theravada belief, right, the rebirth takes place immediately uh, following the death with no intermediate being. The Gandhava is just another <clears throat> name, whatever name you call it, but here it refers to the stream of consciousness, like right? which Jnana Sota. Stream of consciousness, they're carrying the karmic forces aspire to be reborn. So therefore the Buddha uses of this term is without any substantialist notion. So in this case, the Gandhava referred to a suitable being driven by the karmic forces, ready to be born in that particular womb, right? And this term is used only in this particular connection and must not be mistaken for a permanent self. <clears throat> so to conclude, the origins of Gandhava is very pre-Buddhistic and of various interpretation. So I have concluded with these four interpretations of Gandhava. One, is one of the three conditions postulated by Brahmin for the conception of being, right? And the second is the Apsara, is a celestial musician. So <clears throat> while in our discussion of the intermediate being just now, the Gandhava referred to the ghost, Preta, who live on the gift of others. Okay, the Gandhava. They belong to the caste of Vedas. And the fourth, the Gandhava belong to the class of being belonging to the Ashura. Wow, okay. So it's not easy to understand the Gandhava. So the Gandhava has a wide range of understanding. <clears throat> now we come to number four. Okay, Naga, snake, or sometimes we translate as a dragon, right? So in each Asia, like in China, Japan, Naga is considered as a kind of dragon, right? Because Chinese doesn't like se, uh, they like long, <laughs> so it's a kind of dragon. So <clears throat> these Nagas are living in various parts of the human inhabited earth. Uh, some of them are water dwellers, you know, some living in the stream or in the ocean, right? Then as we have said that these Nagas are the retinue of followers of one of the king of the four heavenly king who guards the western direction and they act as a guard right upon the Mount Sumerio right protecting the devas of Tawatinsa from the attack of the Ashura. Then among the Nagas of Buddhist tradition I think the famous one is the Muchalinda Right, Muchalinda. He is a protector of the Buddhas. Uh, in the Vinaya Mahavaga, short after, shortly after the Buddha's enlightenment, you know, the Buddha, while well, Buddha meditate, you know, in a forest, <clears throat> then a great storm, you know, comes. A huh? great storm comes, right? heavy rain. Then the king Muchalinda, you know, gives shelter to the Buddhas, you know, from the storm and by covering the Buddha's head, with his seven snack head, uh, seven snack head. And we also find the terms Naga occur in our bhikkhu <coughs> high ordination. There's a record that the Naga pretends, you know, as a human and attempted to become some monk. And 
he was asked okay to leave uh, the order by the buddhas because he did not meet the qualification of being a human being so we can see that this naga is very close to the human being but they just appeared in the naga form but okay <clears throat> sorry so now we pray you know to the dharma protectors you know for protection you know warding off you know from harms and dangers so the buddha says the best way is to cultivate loving kindness huh? or to recite the karyamita suttas or radiate loving kindness to all sentient beings whether visible or invisible neutral and hostile in order to resolve violence hostility and anger yeah, so this is a verse. Nahi verena verani samanti de kudachana a verena cha samanti is a dhammo sanantano. Hatred is never at peace by hatred in this world. It is at peace only by loving kindness. And this is the ancient law. <clears throat> so people usually think that the yaksha is more terrifying than the ghost. But I want to make a remark, even a person who has no self-control, no precept, bad precept, or clinging to the right, to the wrong views, or indulging you know, in the sensual pleasure, in fact, they are more terrifying, more scary than the yaksha. And uh, as we have said, you see, these guardian deities, they will protect the virtuous people, right? Knowing that you know, if they harm the virtuous people, they will get the evil result, right? So their job is to come, you know, to protect the people, check whether people are protecting their morality, are doing good deeds or not, are, 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 are showing respect to the parents or not, you see? So, <clears throat> however, as we see uh, the present situation, that, that this will not be the case in the future because we human beings are to be blamed uh, and responsible for our evil deeds, such as greed, hatred, and delusion for destroying the world or making this world not safe to live. That's why all these protectors will not come to the world. So all the evil, right, disasters will, will be rampant in the future. So, yeah, <clears throat> usually when we finish, you know, we will share the marriage with them. And this is one of the Anumodana. And the story is this, right? Once after the imperial, you know, Bimbisara, you know, the, the king Bimbisara, you know, asked the Buddha. Then the Buddha uh, called, you know, the monks, you know, at the end of the marriage, right? You should share all your marriage with the gods in the air and gods on the ground and all the sentient beings. Then from there on, you know, it has become a custom of the Buddha's disciple to share marriage with all the sentient beings, including the God, you know, after making good marriage. So this is, uh, you know, <clears throat> this is the verses, yeah, inviting devas, you know, to rejoice our good acts. Yeah, so this is a translation, right? So a person who always practice good deeds and know how to share his marriage with the God after doing good karma, then the God will protect him, help him, and support him with joy. And of course, the places where the God often comes to rejoice married will be full of like and auspicious sign. Right? Then, then the protector, uh, uh, you know, the, likes to guard the good people, protect the good people. Uh, then the good people who lead a holy life, right, uh, will not only bring themselves the present happiness and the future happiness, uh, but they're also uh, guarding the benefits of the happiness of the world. Uh, we call them, these good peoples are called the messenger of the world. Because of the existence of these good peoples and morality, these guardian deities will continue guarding the world. Okay, uh, so, okay, so this is, this is the end. Uh, of my talk today, right? But before we share the marriage, so we leave this question for we leave this session for Q and A. 
I think short I'll do. Eh? Yeah. Thank you, Bante, for <coughs> clarifying uh, all the guardian deities and the Nagas, Gandabas. There are four questions, six questions now. Wait, wait, uh, I want to <laughs> I want to quick my <laughs> Can you, can you pick my, my system? Stop, stop, stop share. Yes, stop yes. sharing. Is it, is it stop already? Uh, no, still there. <laughs> Let me check because I try. Oh. Should, should be stop already. Right? No, still there. Already? Still there. Uh, is it? Is it still ready? Because my system a bit stuck here. Doesn't matter, we pin pin the spotlight on you. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay, Bante, uh, first question from uh, WH Chan, KCBA. Does the devas and those beings always protect humans who always bring them offerings to them, who always send metta to all beings, always keep their moral precepts? Wait, uh, I, I just wait, uh, try to check. Look, check here. Yeah. Because my system stuck here. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Uh, Does the devas and those beings look, okay, the chat, yeah, look, sorry. protect humans who bring offerings to them, send metta and keep moral precepts? Where is it? Uh? The first question. Scroll uh, right to the top. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, now already come up, is it? Yeah, because I, I tried to look at the chart. Uh, Bante, does the devas and those beings will always protect humans who always bring offer to them who will send meta to I, I don't really get it huh? it means those good people uh, bring offerings uh, do meta and keep precepts will the devas protect these people oh yes definitely yeah definitely yeah, we do. See, like, yeah, just now we have seen in, in, in my explanation, uh, if the, the devil usually will protect good people, those who come, you know, to do the dana, to do the good meditacy, who observe the sila, you see? So they will protect the good people. Surely, yeah, sure. Yeah. Next question. Bante, does it mean that the Chatu Maharaja Sutta apply only to Buddhists? What happens if our relatives or next generation are not Buddhist? Does it mean they will not be under the radar of the four kings? <laughs> <laughs> you see, uh, you know, these Dharma protectors are not really Buddhist origin. You see, if you look at this, this concept, they are very pre-Buddhistic. You see, so, and they are, you know, even before the Buddhas, you see, this concept was there already, right? So, um, uh, of course, we have to be careful when answering this question. That is to say, whether it is Buddhist or not Buddhist, I think uh, it is not the main issue here, right? But if you are doing good thing, that for sure, some invisible forces, you know, will come and protect you. Okay, next question. Bhante, we have many friends who follow Tibetan Buddhism. They emphasize a lot on Dharma protectors for their practice, praying to them every day. But in Theravada Buddhism, we don't see that emphasis. Only see a handful of Dharma protectors here and there in temples. Can Bhante elaborate more on Dharma protectors? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think this is very interesting because I have read, you know, the Tibetan version of Dharma protectors and the understanding of Dharma protector is very different from us. And for oh, they are, you know, Tibetan Dharma protectors, you know, they have a belief, uh, you know, a general belief that these Dharma protectors are the emanation, right, of the enlightened beings. 
And this Dharma Protector will help, will assist the practitioners, uh, you know, to create a conducive environment, uh, conducive, conducive and condition for their elimination, for the elimination of obstacle, right? That block their spiritual path. And for example, uh, you know, this uh, for the Tibetan tradition, right? When they said that as a human being, you know, encounter a lot of problems on their daily basis. And most of the time, these problems consume a lot of their times and effort and limiting them. Um, so as a result, limiting, you know, their time, they spend on their spiritual development. So they said they cannot solve, you know, this problem quickly and effectively without some forms of help. Right? So this Dharma protector will help them by removing such obstacles. So it is in this regard that we see the Dharma protectors help to create a conducive condition for the practitioners, you know, to afford, you know, more time for the spiritual development. And of course, it says that at the higher level of higher level, right, of Dharma, uh, you know, the Dharma protector also can help to remove the inner obstacle to their spiritual path. <clears throat> so, yeah. So, whereas in Theravada, we don't have that uh, practice like praying the Dharma protectors, you know, for facilitating our cultivation, part of cultivation. I think that is because Theravada have that teaching of one, sorry, one is one on masters, you see, or one is one on refuge. Who else could be the refuge? And because of this kind of attitudes, you know, Theravada Buddhists, you know, put less emphasis on the Dharma protector. But however, in the Theravada tradition, uh, usually when we do the chanting, we do invite the Dharma protectors to come, you know, to listen to the Buddha Dharma. And at the end, we share merits with them for their ultimate liberation in Nibbana. So of course, in return, somehow we expect, you see, them to protect us, you know, from harm and danger. And definitely Theravada never pray for the facilitation for our own spiritual development. Instead, Theravada Buddhists, you know, cultivate radiant loving kindness and compassion with them. Next question, uh, Bhante. <clears throat> Why do most Dharma protectors appear very fierce, very wrathful forms? Yeah. <laughs> I feel so. <laughs> yeah, I think this is interesting because, um, yeah, even in Theravada also, we find a lot of these uh, Dharma protectors, uh, these deities are in the form of the very wrathful manner, right? And I think we have to know one thing, you know, these Dharma protectors appears in this wrathful nature, you know, that is a kind of symbolic of the quality of extreme compassion. You know, that the enlightened beings, you know, for the sentient being. So there is this analogy mentioned, right? That is like a mother, you know, scolding her child for doing something very bad, you see? So for example, like the children playing the fire, then the mother will scold the children severely, something like that. So that is due to, you know, this, this, this kind of form, very wrathful form is due to the the kind of extreme compassion, right, to assist and benefit the sentient being. And of course, there is another understanding of this wrathful nature. That is because, uh, uh, you know, when the, the, the down protector appear in this kind of a very, this kind of wrathful form, you see, in fact, they can overcome the evil or negative karma that stop us from practicing the dharma. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bhante. Next question from Brother Hai Ing. How do we know Devas, Yakas, Nagas and Gandabas are following us in our daily life? What can we do to live in harmony with them? It's okay. I think they also have their own life to live. So no need to bother them. We have our own life to live, right? But as a human beings, we are very fortunate because we are able to listen to the Buddha's Dharma. So why not? We, whenever we you know, do the chanting or listening to the dharmas or doing something good this, we want to share with them so that, you know, they also rejoice, you know, in this meditative state, but they're better rebirth. 
Yeah, because they don't have they don't have that kind of ability. It is us. We invite them to come in and listen to the Dharma. So yeah, so you know in Theravada we don't have that that, uh, that kind of practice. You see, to depending on them for all this very secular, mundane, you know that kind of happiness. Yeah. Thank you, Bante. Next question from Brother A L Chan: Why good yakas cannot fight? And uh, they are more superior than bad yakas, especially in the forest and at night time at dark alleys, etc. Why? Repeat again. Why good yaka cannot fight bad yaka? <laughs> I think it's quite quite common sense. Yeah, good one never fight with the bad one. You see, because <laughs> when we talk about the good one, they are the dharma dharma protectors. I think these good dharma protectors they also want to do merits, right? Because they listen to the dharma, they know. You know, when you when they do bad, that will bring their evil consequences. So they are not they are no more doing, you know, evil deeds. Instead, they will come and protect us. Okay, so I think that makes a make, makes the difference between the evil and the good one. Thank you, Bandi. Next question from Christine Tan: Are there celestial nagas in heaven? I don't know. I never see that, but yeah, in, in a Buddhist tradition, we do we do have that belief, right? That the uh, the nagas, you know, in the celestial, because they they live, you know, in the in the lower what do you call the lower devas, lower devas. It means that they live on the earth, they live in the lower heaven, in between the the heaven and the and the world. Okay, so yeah, of course, uh, these are all the mythology, yeah, so. Yeah, but that you find in 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 even in the Ravada tradition, the belief of Naga. Okay. Next question from Susan Yap. We live in a place where our houses are built on land reclaimed from forest, or sometimes from graveyards. Do you think the beings there will feel happier? Ah, uh, of course you have to make a demarcation, right? Uh, I think demarcation is very important. It's just like. When you want to build a house, you will demarcate the lane. Okay, demarcate the lane. Ah, this is the lane where human beings stay, right? And of course, like in our our forefather, when they when they when they say like when they go to the forest, you see, they will pray to certain deities. Okay, telling the deities that now I want to cut the trees, you know, in this area. So inviting the devas, you know, uh, this this dharma protector to live, right? It's just like during the Buddha's time when the disciples you know meditate in the forest, right? Then the Buddha said, okay, when you meditate in the forest, okay, you have to recite the Karanamita Suttas, you know, so that this Dharma protector will not will not get angry with you. It's like someone stranger who come and occupy my space, right? So if you have a nice talk with the, you know, this uh, Dharma protector or any of these these kind of spirits, I think they will be very willing, very happy to leave the place. Because these devas, these deity, they will protect the people, the good people. So if say like if you are building a house, okay, after making a demarcation, the land, things like that, probably you can invite the sangha, you know, to to do a blessing, inviting you know these then devas, you know, to leave the place, you know, or find a better place, or ask them to rejoice in the merits that you have done, so that these merits will will leave this place happily. So this is what the Buddhist tradition will do, usually. Thank you, Bante. Last two questions. I think can we stop now? <laughs> okay. Okay. Quick one, is it? Okay. Ah, uh, one question. Last uh, question. From uh, Hakuna Makat Matata. Do we need to pray to all these devas or nagas? Since there are, I believe, some of them are the old traditions of beliefs. Example, praying to Kuan Yu or Kuan Yin or other Indian and Chinese deities, or we just stick to Buddhist teachings, the simplest form. Thank you, Bante. Okay. I think this answer is very clear because when we talk about praying to the God and paying respect to the the Buddhas, are quite two different form. You see, when we say paying respect to the Buddha, we never ask anything from the Buddhas, right? And we have a lot of gratitude to the Buddha, uh, and we never ask a favor, you know, from the Buddhas. But whereas when we say the praying, you know, to this this God, we say we are we are asking for, uh, you know, this mundane, you know, this this well asking for the mundane happiness. Yeah, so that makes a difference. So I think I mean in Theravada, surely, 
we we have that less emphasis in asking uh you know uh, asking from these you know these dharma protectors for this mundane happiness but we cannot deny there are people asking you know a certain you know uh, a certain worldly happy certain worldly mundane things uh, surely this uh, dharma protector will you know will fulfill but i think we have to mind you one thing you know even they fulfill you you have to pay back also there is nothing there is no free meal right so um, we have to pay back okay so this is eternal law okay thank you ah, thank you bante so can bante kindly uh, lead the sharing of merits and uh, close the session Thank you very much, uh, all the participating societies for coming in. Let us uh, say sadhu three times to Bhante. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay. Can you help to put on the screen? Uh, my, my system can't, I can't share oh, my screen. Share my screen. Know. I don't have your slides. Okay, okay. But now, now I'm okay already. Hmm. Is it okay? Yep. Can can see. Okay. Akasatta chebo mata devanaga mahedika punyantang anumoditwa chirang rakkan tu buddha sasanang chirang rakkan tu desanang Chirang ra kan to mang parang ti Eta wata che am he hi Sampadang punya sampadang Sabe deva Sabe buta Sabe sata anumodantum Sabe sang pati sidiya Idang meng ya ti nang ho tu sukita hon tu ya chayo. Idang meng ya ti nang ho tu sukita hon tu ya chayo. Idang meng ya ti nang ho tu sukita hon tu ya chayo. Imi na po nga kamena. Ma me ba la sa ma ga mo Sa tang sa ma ga mo ho tu Ya va ni ba na pa ti ya Ka ye na wa cha chi te na Pa ma te na ma ya ka ta A cha yang ka ma me ba ni Bu ri pa nya Tata gata Kayena vacha chitena Pamadena maya gata Achayang kama medam Sanditika akalika Kayena vacha chitena Pamadena maya gata Achayang kama me sang supati pan anotar Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu Thank you, Bhante. And uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. Shall we close now? Yeah, we can close now. But they can leave. Huh? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bhante. Okay, so thank you very much. So see you. Have a nice yeah. weekend. Yeah. See you. Thank you, Bhante. <laughs>